Well, it was 70 degrees when I woke up this morning, and now it's 38. So I put on my beanie, and I'm thinking about Ernest Shackleton's expedition of 1914 to 1917 to cross the Antarctic continent on foot. He had a team of 27 men. He left England on August 1st, 1914. That was the day the First World War began. Uh, he had to get permission from the First Lord of the Admiralty to leave, and that was Winston Churchill at the time. And so he set forth on this amazingly ambitious journey uh, that uh, would take the team first to the remote island of South Georgia, off the tip of South, South America, and then he would um, approach uh, Antarctica through the Weddell Sea. And he had for a vessel uh, one of the sturdiest uh, barks that had ever been built, a three-masted bark built, custom built by Norwegian uh, shipbuilders, extraordinarily thick, dense uh, wooden sides designed to uh, withstand pressure of the ice. Uh, now, there was just one problem, uh, and that was the ice in the Weddell Sea. He was warned by the uh, the whalers on the island of South Georgia not to um, proceed because the ice was unusually thick and dense. And uh, this was the mid middle of summer; it was December, so he they, it was an unusual situation and. He ignored them. Uh, he did not take their advice. Uh, he could have um, waited a year on South Georgia. It would have been boring, but less boring than being trapped on the ice. But I don't want to give the story away. And, um, and uh, so he proceeded, and they very quickly became beset in the ice. Um, Within a couple of weeks, they literally could not move. Now, I'm re recording this first um, portion because I didn't like the way it went before. But let me just say, I, I was making uh, an analogy with um, software development. <laughs> I'll try again. And so I have worked in IT for a long time, and a couple of the startups I worked for had this huge coffee table book, beautiful pictures of Shackleton's expedition. And, um, you know, it's held up as one of the greatest feats of endurance ever. And, um, and endurance was the name of the ship, which I should have said already. And um, it's very emblematic of a lot of software projects. There are enormous hopes and ambitions at the beginning, and um, enormous effort is put into making a success of the company, and invariably they fail. That's the truth about software startups. Most of them fail, nine out of 10 at least, and uh, the whole thing is futile, except I guess the software engineers get paid, and they have camaraderie during, um, during the project. Uh, so, that was my analogy. Now, let's move on with the story. Well, this uh, recruitment ad uh, was almost certainly apocryphal, made up after the expedition, but it's got a lot of currency. Uh, so, men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success, Ernest Shackleton for Burlington Street. So <laughs> I'm almost sure this is a lie, but anyway, it's fun. So here's a map of the expedition plan. 
and uh, actually what happened, the retreat back to South Georgia, but the plan was to get to the continent via the Weddell Sea and cross the continent at this narrow point, so to speak, to pay a stop at the pole, at the, at the South Pole and continue to the Ross Ice Sheet. And uh, there was another party over here waiting for them. And that party also um, strategically placed stashes of supplies and food on the route. In fact, they got a lot, uh, they got far into the continent, about 1300 miles, I think, but all in vain uh, because uh, Shackleton and his men never showed up. The, uh, so the reason um, Shackleton had come up with this plan to cross the continent on foot, uh, and I think they were, the dogs were for pulling the supplies on the sleds only, uh, was um, to, um, to recover a little bit of pride for Great Britain because the Norwegian explorer Roald Amundsen had easily conquered the South Pole in 1911. Um, so that was done. Uh, you know, this was the heroic age of uh, polar exploration. And this was the greatest prize of all, reaching the South Pole, and it had been done. So this was second prize that Shackleton was taking. But anyway, uh, all his hopes came to an end when the endurance was set in the ice. Oh no. <laughs> in January 1915, it became beset, completely icebound, in the Weddell Sea near Varsi Bay, a few miles from the Antarctic mainland. And that's the closest they got to the mainland of Antarctica. And uh, so what happened next? Um, not very much. There was not much they could do. The crew stayed uh, aboard the trapped ship through the entire Arctic um, winter. And they occupied themselves uh, through the months of total darkness with, uh, with a routine of maintaining the ship, uh, playing games, singing, smoking, and performing silly skits. Uh, so you can imagine these young men putting on silly skits <laughs> for each other, um, something like Monty Python, um, uh, and, you know, stiff upper lip. Uh, and um, they stayed on the ship through October the 27th of the following year, uh, when it was about to be crushed. Um, so extraordinarily, they stayed on it through the following summer. I don't know what they were waiting for, but um, they didn't abandon their home till October 27th, when it was about to be crushed by massive ice flows that had enveloped the ship. Um, and when they did abandon the ship, they experienced the full shock of the elements, um, beginning with a, a futile and three-day march over the ice to establish a temporary camp. And not clear why they marched three days to establish the camp. Maybe they were looking for more stable ice. Um, and that was interrupted by a mad rush back to the boat to recover more provisions from the ship before it went down. So uh, I just recorded um, the story of Captain Bly, William Bly and Fletcher Christian. And I see a lot of parallels. Uh, in, in both cases, uh, you had a natural leader, but one who was prone to making poor decisions. And um, in the case of the Mutiny on the Bounty story, uh, of course, um, Fletcher Christian took control of the bounty and um, 
when he found his little island Pitcairn, um, he decided to abandon the ship completely and take everything of value out of the ship. And, um, and knowing that, he, well, it would be destroyed, he had to destroy it uh, in order to hide their whereabouts. Well, in this case, the ship was going to be destroyed by the ice flows and they had to get everything off the ship, but which is what they did. And uh, they then embarked on a march to open water. By the way, I should say that um, the boat came to a very sad end, this beautiful Norwegian bark. It was just engulfed in snow and compressed, and it was groaning and shrieking and cracking and um, scaring the dogs. They were mesmerized by it, apparently in this photograph. Um, they were watching the end of the Endurance, which was their home for a year or more than a year. So uh, then they, the crew embarked on this desperate march to open water. It was, they made an arduous journey of two months and let's go to the next slide. So they were dragging these, hauling these three heavy lifeboats, which was uh, obviously, you know, their only means of escape, these three heavy lifeboats and all the equipment taken off the ship. And actually it was extremely hot and sweaty work. This was summer again in uh, Antarctica, and it was actually under the sun, extremely hot work that they were performing. And um, on December 23rd, Shackleton abandoned the effort. Um, so what they would do, what this was his idea that they would make a camp and wait uh, for the late summer melt of the ice flows that surrounded them. Um, this is something he knew about based on his experience, uh, that there would be, um, a, it was sufficiently close to the open water that the ice would melt up to where they were. Um, so that was his idea. Um, here's the thing he hadn't bargained for. Um, so um, what it was was, he projected the rate and direction of the rotating ice mass in the Waddell Sea, and um, and um, he got it wrong, and it made his original preferred island destinations impossible. The one he wanted um, to um, to head for uh, was the uh, was Paulette Island. And the reason for that was 12 years previously um, on another mission, um, he had stashed a substantial amount of food uh, for this expedition, which was never consumed. I guess the expedition didn't go exactly according to plan. So there was a lot of food on Paulette Island, which would be perfectly fine in deep freeze for the last 12 years. But the problem was that's not where the rotation and direction of the rotating ice came out. Uh, by March uh, 1916, um, well, they needed food. So unfortunately they slaughtered all the dogs and even the ship's cat, uh, the adorable ship's cat they all loved, they had slaughtered all of these animals, 69 dogs, and the ship's cat had been killed for food. And um, but, so they basically used all their food up at this stage. The ice flow uh, that they were camped on split in two, um, separating them from their lifeboat. So this was kind of the low point of the expedition the most desperate moment in the expedition. They were separated from their lifeboats because the ice flow they were camped on split in two. And they were being circled by killer whales, orcas, 
FDR, who were being circled by hawkers. Um, well, somehow they were able to recover the boats. I'm not sure how. And in an act of desperation, on April 19th, the whole crew went to sea in the three lifeboats uh, in a quest for one of the most inhospitable islands in the world. And this was Elephant Island. It was a 200 mile week long voyage um, in open boats over treacherous waters to reach um, a tiny speck. And if they missed it, uh, they would die in the open ocean. Uh, fortunately, it seems um, uh, Shackleton was a better sailor than uh, explorer, <laughs> to be <laughs> perfectly blunt. He was a very good sailor. Um, so they survived this 200-mile voyage in open lifeboats. Uh, um, to the island, Elephant Island, but it had nothing uh, to offer but steep, rocky ledges. Oh, let's have a look at Elephant Island. So this is Elephant Island, delightful. Uh, um, um, but at least it was solid ground. The first uh, the men had stood on for 497 days. Uh, since the expedition had departed South Georgia, and that they, there was no way they could reach South Georgia at this stage. So they found the one spot on the island that afforded some shelter, uh, which is just essentially under a rocky ledge, um, and they hunkered down for the southern winter, just north of the Antarctic Circle. So yeah, Elephant Island is just north of the Antarctic Circle. Uh, and uh, within days, Shackleton uh, announced he would leave and attempt to sail to the distant South Georgia. Not with the whole team, obviously, but just with a couple of hand-selected people. Um, so, so how did the, uh, how is the crew, how is the team, um, how are the men, <laughs> Uh, expected to survive on this totally inhospitable island uh, with little shelter and with apparently no food. Well, it turned out there was a very nice food source, not only a food source, a source of heating or uh, warming, uh, uh, so you know, a source of heat, yes. <laughs> um, and it turned out um, this source of food and heat was seals. Apparently they used to bask on the rocks and they were easy to bludgeon to death and they had blubber and meat and the blubber was an excellent uh, means of uh, creating fire and maintaining it and producing heat and the, um, the protein was plentiful in the uh, seals, there were a couple of nutritional things that they were lacking, but it enabled survival. There was very, very little carbohydrates, of course, none at all, I think. And this actually sort of disabled the men. They had very low energy, but they were able to, to survive. Now, um, okay, so Shackleton selected five men um, with the, and they chose the largest lifeboat. And let's have a look. There they are, five men and Shackleton. And uh, you see that the lifeboat had been covered. So this was the remarkable work of the carpenter. Um, he had uh, raised the ship's sides and he had um, built an improvised deck. And uh, without the carpenter, they never would have made it. Um, and they set out for a hellish 17-day voyage of 800 nautical miles, um, you know, under treacherous conditions and navigation against adverse winds and currents. Um, 
but they made it. Storms actually helped them by driving them ashore on the wrong side of Georgia Island, but South Georgia Island, but at least they made it to this island. But it was by all accounts a terrible, terrible journey. Um, so, um, Shackleton decided um, that, so he decided that they could not um, uh, circumnavigate the island uh, to the whaling station on this boat. It was too treacherous, it, the odds against it were too poor. So he took another route option that was equally precarious and unlikely to succeed, um, and that was to, um, for, he, for him and two others, to set out by foot across the mountains of South Georgia. And uh, no one had ever done this. It was unmapped, it was uncharted. Um, it was something of a suicide mission. Um, it was extremely mountainous. Um, they were gonna do a 25 mile trek over icy peaks under you know, extraordinarily exposed conditions. Um, and um, almost miraculously, uh, they, were a they succeeded. Um, uh, they completed the journey in 36 hours with life and limb intact. Um, and they did it without sleep because they knew if they slept, they would die. They would fall asleep. They would, uh, they would die of exposure if they slept. So they just um, gave it all they had. Um, one of the things they did was they actually um, slid down the mountain slopes, um, uh, you know, as if they were on a toboggan or something. They just let it go. Um, rather than expending any energy at all on the descents uh, down these islands, uh, down these mountains. And um, um, they all recounted a feeling of having an invisible guide uh, uh, that, that helped them, like another person uh, who was helping them. This was just an experience they all had. So this was really, I think, like a near-death experience for the three of them, um, and um, they heard a wonderful sound after 36 hours, and that was a steam whistle blow um, at early in the morning at the whaling station. So they knew they were close to this whaling station. They didn't see it yet, and actually they had one more... Um, hazard, um, which they had to um, pass the test for, <laughs> and this was a frozen waterfall, totally frozen, and they had to negotiate uh, their way ar around this frozen waterfall, but they made it, and um, evidently they were greeted with amazement by the inhabitants of the whaling station. Um, and, um, you know, <laughs> one wonders what the uh, members of the whaling station really thought, because um, they had warned Shackleton not to proceed at that, you know, two years ago, um, and he had ignored them. But anyway, they nursed them back to health, and actually they went and got the three that were left behind on the other side of the island. They recovered them very, very quickly. Um, but that left the 23 men on um, on Ele Elephant Island. What, what was going to become of them? So this is the whaling station in South Georgia. I think it's an authentic picture and there's a massive whale carcass there, not a great place to work. Uh, however, this is where Shackleton and the other four members of his team recovered and within only three days Shackleton was arranging um, 
a ship to recover his men in Elephant Island. Um, so uh, th this was quite a sort of dramatic story of, uh, again, a number of failures before he was able to recover them. Uh, first, he retained a, um, a British ship somehow very quickly, uh, but it was stopped by ice 100 miles short of the island, so that didn't bode very well. Then the Uruguay uh, government loaned a survey ship, uh, which came within sight of the island uh, before pack ice uh, prevented it from getting closer. And um, independently, a British chartered schooner set out from uh, Punta Arenas, Chile, and got uh, again within 100 miles of Elephant Island before storms and ice forced it to return. Finally, on August 25th, Chilean authorities loaned a small steamer uh, which set sail to the island uh, with Shackleton aboard. Uh, the Elephant Island survivors um, would, spotted the ship and uh, set light to a huge blob of fire, smoking blob of fire. And um, the men were rescued after 131 days on the island, on the frigid island and every member of the crew had survived. So that was a remarkable feat. And that's why um, the legend of uh, this uh, survival story lives on to today and is a wonderful thing. However, what uh, is forgotten is there was another far less known support expedition on the other side of Antarctica. Uh, that had been waiting for the arrival of Shackleton's party for two years, for two years. But they were oblivious to the fate of the endurance. Uh, Shackleton's second team had anchored in the Ross Sea and had cached more than 4,000 pounds of provisions on the Ross ice shelf. Uh, in other words, they had gone on a lot of mini treks to spread the provisions around um, in order to supply Shackleton's um, main polar trek. And um, they didn't learn the futility of their heroic efforts under terrible conditions until 14 months later, long after Shackleton had rescued his crew, long after Shackleton rescued his crew, they were still waiting on the other side, oblivious. Uh, to what had happened. So the Ross Sea Party had marched 1,500 miles. Uh, you know, 1,500 miles, this was quite a feat to accomplish the only successful part of the Imperial Trans-Antarctic Expedition. And the cost was three lives, uh, including the team's leader. So three men did die, and I think people seldom hear about that aspect of uh, the expedition. So that's the history. So uh, you decide whether this was the greatest survival story or an epic failure, your decision. I just wanted to put two postscripts on that. Um, so yes, the photographs um, were taken by an Australian uh, member of the crew, Frank Burley, and he did a remarkable job, extraordinary. And that's really what brings uh, the story to life. And that's how you get these glossy, um, big fat books, coffee table books in um, IT uh, offices. <laughs> uh, the other thing is, and this is really puts um, uh, Shackleton's character in a bad light. He picked a fight with Henry McNeish, the shipwright, the carpenter who built up the lifeboat in order for them to get to South Georgia. For some reason, there was very bad blood between them. Uh, never explained, um, and Henry McNeish was denied the Polar Medal, which uh, was awarded to all the other members of the expedition, I believe. Um, and yet Henry McNeish was the one man who made the survival story m more possible than anyone else on the team. So uh, thank you for listening. It was a pleasure talking to you. Bye.